It's a very great honor for me to be invited to speak to you today. And my subject, of course, is American universities, universities in general, but American universities in particular. And I want to comment on three things. First, I want to say something about the nature or the character of these very unusual and very special institutions and about the sources of their success. Second, I want to say something about the criticisms and critiques uh, that one hears today about uh, modern universities. And third and finally, I will comment on how American universities are changing in major ways, I think, and will continue to change in the coming decade. And at the end, I may add a few comments on how the Trump presidency is affecting our system of universities. So my purpose is to offer a small contribution to the discussion you are having now about the challenges that lie ahead in Europe as reflected in your Global Trends to 2030 uh, report. Specifically, I want to explain how changes that are taking root in American higher education mean that the world I come from should be an increasingly valuable partner and resource as you pursue the difficult but essential work of thinking seriously and critically about the future. First then, let me turn to the nature and success of American universities. In the United States, there are about 60 major research universities. Most of them are state or public institutions rather than private. The principal distinction between the two is no longer in their basic character or values as it once was, but rather primarily in their respective sources of funding. While both public and private universities have access to large revenue streams from the federal government, mostly having to do with biomedical research and scientific research, only public universities receive annual financial support from their respective state legislatures. And over the past century, this blended system of major research universities, both public and private in their form, along with a myriad of colleges and other non-research universities, has widely been recognized as the premier system of higher education in the world. These institutions are indisputably the primary source of discoveries that have fueled virtually every meaningful advance in modern life and have brought us to where we are today. From groundbreaking medical breakthroughs to agricultural innovations credited with saving billions of people around the world, to the internet, to artificial intelligence, this and so much more, is the result of university-based research. We need, therefore, to begin by recognizing the astounding successes and achievements of the modern system of research universities. At the same time, these successes highlight a striking and even strange fact, namely that these institutions are organized in what can only be fairly described as the most bizarre ways. No expert in organizational structure would ever come up with an academic institution we have developed, nor predict that they would be as successful as they have been. Essentially, the idea of a university is to hire quite young and therefore naturally unproven people who have succeeded brilliantly in their studies give them a period of five to seven years to see what they can do in the way of original work, and then if approved, offer them a lifetime appointment as a professor with more or less full control over the course of their thinking and research. To a professor, at least in America, the concept of a boss is utterly foreign. One might reasonably think that this would be a recipe for mediocrity and laziness, producing precious little advances in the search for truth. But in fact, it seems to activate a sense of dedication and determination in virtually everyone. The atmosphere of a university is vibrant, purposeful, and constantly creative, 
generating invaluable results, all of which are easily witnessed in modern daily life and traceable to the labs and libraries that constitute the independent academy. There are, to be sure, many strongly voiced criticisms of universities, which I raise in part because they have some truth, but mostly to say they are not fully true and they detract our attention from this remarkable story of success. We are said to be inefficient and too costly, leaving students who are not from affluent families with life-disabling debt at a time of historic inequality. We hear over and over again about the $1.5 trillion in outstanding liabilities resulting from student loans, coupled with dire predictions that this system will implode in just the way the subprime mortgage market did in 2007 and 8. We are described as having our heads in the sand, not seeing the impact of digital technology on producing equally effective but far cheaper education. Just as newspaper editors, whose former business model is now crumbling beneath them, could not imagine a world in which people would not go to their front porch every morning to pick up their daily newspaper. This new reality, it is said, will inexorably lead to the certain upending of our business model as education, like news, moves onto the internet. We are criticized for being too left-leaning politically, too politically correct in our thinking, and too coddling of a newer, younger generation that seeks safe spaces where they will never have to confront an opinion they don't like. There are, of course, serious and complex issues here, but here are my very quick responses. Yes, it is true that over the past decades, tuition has risen considerably more than the consumer price index, but there are two points. Before addressing whether the comparison is apt, I must point out that at a private university like Columbia, Undergraduate financial aid is such that the admissions process is truly need blind. And so if your family has an income of $60,000 or less, you come for free to Columbia. Our public universities, on the other hand, face a different set of financial constraints. Namely, the precipitous and deeply regrettable decline that has occurred in the funding provided by state legislatures something I witnessed firsthand as president of the University of Michigan. For these institutions, who generally do not have the endowments or streams of private donations, that, that lack of state legislative commitment and support has been the primary driver of the increased expenses they must shoulder, which has translated into higher tuition rates. The problem is with state legislative allocations not with simply a desire to raise tuition. But second, on the matter of university costs and tuition outpacing the consumer price index, this is an issue that begs the following question. Should we understand the rising costs for housing and food, which is basically what the CPI measures, in the same way that we evaluate increases in the cost of neuroscience research that may one day cure Alzheimer's disease, to take one example? I believe that it is wrong to equate the two. For in a world where the frontiers of knowledge and the number of subjects warranting sustained exploration are rapidly expanding, it would be self-defeating to impose an ordinary inflationary gauge on resources society devotes to academic research. As far as the charge of coddling students who are not prepared or willing to embrace the challenges that come with freedom of speech, I have written and spoken about these issues. In essence, I think the critiques are overdone and out of proportion to and not reflective of reality. It is possible, as always, to cite notorious examples of controversial speakers being protested and disrupted invitations and honors revoked under pressure, and other instances of closed-mindedness and intolerance. 
And critics of higher education, often with a larger political agenda of undermining the credibility of our institutions, will never hesitate to point these out. But one has to keep in mind, uh, keep everything in perspective, and recognize that countless controversial speakers visit our campuses every day, all without incident. And while it is only my experience, it's true, perhaps, uh, I do not believe that classrooms across our universities are being used to advance political ideologies and viewpoints. The scholarly temperament, as I like to call it, just like the judicial temperament, in which partisan politics are kept at bay, is as strong today as I have ever seen it. Finally, as to the notion that universities will face the same fate at the hands of the internet as printed newspapers have, this is a hard and dangerous call, but I do not believe we will face a parallel experience here. The personal relationship of teacher and student cannot be replicated on the internet, nor, most important of all, can the culture of open inquiry be reproduced elsewhere. And the value to students of attending our schools will, in my view, continue to be prized. Now, having made reference to the modern American research universities' contributions to society, and also acknowledge the critiques of the current system as it exists today, I'd like to turn to where we are headed. The laudable and ambitious project described by your Global Trends Report is to gain the foresight needed for successfully guiding the efforts of the European Parliament and the EU's other governing bodies over the next decade. The report begins with a series of provocative questions. What are the dynamics we are missing? Are there ways to think differently about the forecasts we are certain about? What different futures can we imagine within the framework of what we know and do not know? The report is replete with prompts for readers to learn more by examining information contained therein, while also acknowledging that there are many deficits in our knowledge. Throughout its pages, it identifies a series of foundational questions to be answered. The nature of this project, examining and understanding the large forces defining the next decade, really requires sustained intellectual exploration and credible research. Accordingly, I would assert that the objective established by the report is unlikely to be achieved unless it is paired with a deliberate and intentional effort to enlist the intellectual resources available for and devoted to creating new knowledge. These intellectual resources, of course, reside primarily in the academic community's research universities. I would also suggest that we would be foolish to ignore ascendant forces in the political arena that actively and sometimes aggressively reject reason and evidence-based discourse because it leads to inconvenient truths. These actors resist the very approach to democratic governance you have described and manifested in your report. But this is yet another reason to engage the engine of productive knowledge, that is, research universities, on which society's foresight is based. Now, against this backdrop, I want to discuss two related yet distinct changes that are occurring in American universities. I believe each is relevant to your objectives. The first concerns how universities are becoming more global in their intellectual orientation and in their physical presence around the world. And the second has to do with the modern research universities escalating engagement with practical affairs and public issues and the increasing concern for the impact of scholarly research beyond our academic gates. These are matters of great significance to Columbia, which is, I like to believe, assuming the lead on these transformations. But in this discussion, I am emphasizing broad trends across American universities. So as I said, we are in the midst of a highly complex transformation that involves globalization 
and the modern research university. But the essential change is that universities are assigning much more significance to the accelerating interdependence of nations and peoples in framing the important questions and puzzles to be addressed through scholarly inquiry. To understand this shift in orientation, I need to provide a brief recap of how we arrived here. After the Second World War and for the next two decades, the broad intellectual framework for universities included developing expertise about the world. This was a major change. But it was done in a very particular way. Regional institutes were established and we saw a proliferation of courses in scholarly research devoted to international human rights, war, peace studies, and international institutions. Students from across the world were invited to our campuses and our students studied abroad. This was a very successful transition to the new world order. There were domestic concerns and there were international concerns and we attended to both. But during the 1980s and 90s, the coherence between academic pursuits and world affairs began to break down. Many disciplines and fields, among them political science, economics, literature, law, and so on, became focused much more upon abstract and theoretical issues detached from practical consequences in the outside world. At the same time, the world itself was undergoing dramatic transformation spurred by three historic forces. The opening to markets and trade, a global communications revolution delivered by the internet, and profound increase in the movements of people around the globe. This reordering of world affairs raised questions and posed new challenges that were captured neither by the prevailing post-World War II academic framework nor the intellectual fashions of the time. The result was the creation of a university culture out of alignment with the world beyond its borders. The expertise on regions and nations of the world was affected by this, sometimes withering, often isolated. American universities began to wake up to this new reality and the need for more direct engagement about a decade ago, and thus far, three st strategies have been deployed in response. The first is to increase institutional practices already in place, more international students, more faculty exchanges, and expanded study abroad opportunities for students. The second response has been to establish branch campuses with separate facilities and separate student bodies around the world. Perhaps the most notable example of this has been the Dubai International Academic City, more commonly known as Education City in Dubai, which was launched in May 2006 and is home now to more than 12,000 students who study in 13 international institutes of higher education sponsored by many American universities. Other examples are NYU's campuses, branch campuses in Abu Dhabi and Singapore, I'm in Shanghai and Yale's in Singapore. Neither of these approaches, in my view, exchange programs and branch campuses seem to me, in the end, to come to terms with the underlying issue of the need for bringing our scholarship and education in better alignment with the world as it is. Their purpose is to facilitate being abroad. Being abroad and studying the new interdependent world are not, however, the same thing and these strategies end up having too little effect, in my view, on transforming the intellectual orientation of the home institutions, which I think is the heart of the problem of modern intellectual life. And for this and other reasons, we at Columbia have established so-called global centers around the world. We have nine now with another on the way. They're small, flexible presences that allow faculty and students to be out in the world teaching and conducting research, but with the expectation that they will be home to inform the thinking on our New York campuses. Other universities are moving in this direction. The upshot of all of this, and what I predict for the future, is a greatly increased presence of American research universities across the world. 
This will be a major transformation. And that leads to the second major change underway, which is the growing willingness on the part of universities more consciously and more explicitly to bring academic research and scholarly capacities to bear on practical problems facing humanity. At Columbia two years ago, we established an entity called Columbia World Projects with that specific goal in mind. To understand the significance of this development from the vantage point of a university president, you have to consider the tension that we deal with. On the one hand, universities must remain somewhat removed from practical world affairs. On the other, there must be some degree of alignment with what it takes as important and humanity takes as important. The two ways of being must be simultaneously present for universities to succeed. There are parts of research university that easily navigate this tension and do so in a straightforward fashion because of their mission. Columbia has a medical center, which is both a leader in medical and biomedical research, but also a major health center providing care at the highest level to patients. No university, however, has assembled and expanded the discrete efforts populating our institutions so that they can be understood as constituting a distinct and central purpose of the university, aggregating the efforts by faculty to have an impact on the world. We need to encourage these efforts, give them proper academic recognition, provide them with support and assistance, and perhaps most importantly, describe them as essential to the university's larger mission. The ultimate aim, however, is for the university as an entity to take on projects that position the university as an actor taking responsibility for participating through academic work with outside partners in solving human problems. I call this the fourth purpose of a university in addition to scholarship, teaching, public service, which is a kind of citizen volunteer work. In our modern world, where nations are frequently overmatched by societal problems extending beyond their borders, and international institutions often struggle to cope with the issues they must confront, it is critically important that other parts of civil society step forward to help by working in partnership to achieve solutions. If this assessment is correct, then what is unfolding at Columbia will continue to expand and will become a trend, as I think it is, across major research universities. It is a responsibility of universities and a much needed corrective. Climate change is a classic example of a global problem cannot be solved by any single nation, it requires basic research and requires action. So here, we are seriously considering creating the first school of climate change uh, in the United States at Columbia. And part of this is this combination of basic academic work and practical involvements. When you take all of these observations together, the upshot is that we can expect the extraordinarily successful system of the American Research University to continue thriving, to become more and more academically focused on very real and practical problems of the modern global world, and to become more engaged with outside partners in helping to solve those problems. These are all trends I believe we should all welcome and applaud. I feel I cannot end without adding a comment about the phenomenon of the rise of so-called populist and nationalist politics across the world, but in the United States in particular, and the lamentable rise of authoritarian-style leaders and the consequences for our universities. The tactics of these movements are familiar to everyone here. They begin with the call typically for particular religious, ethnic, racial, or national identity, followed by claims that that identity is under threat it comes proposals of a dubious public policy solutions and hyperbolic claims of accomplishment. All of this built on a foundation of relentless disregard for the truth and assertions that the media are deliberately spreading falsehoods 
so that followers may believe whatever they wish. Along the way, opponents are demonized, particularly foreigners and immigrants, and the evil and potent political empowerment of private intolerance is effectively deployed. The manifestations of this dispiriting historical moment are discussed endlessly around the globe and certainly I know here in Brussels. We cannot look the other way to ignore this political and social phenomenon. Clearly you have confronted this frightening politics in your 2030 report. What though has been the impact on major research universities and higher education in the United States so far? At the moment, I think the impact broadly viewed on the pursuit of knowledge and on our daily research, scholarship and teaching has been minor, at least compared to other dark moments in American history, such as the McCarthy period of the 1950s. Federal funding of research continues to grow and there have been relatively few attempts at overt censorship. Campuses remain vital and vibrant. But there are two areas of concern. First, there have been significant disruptions in the flow of international students, beginning with the travel ban targeting Muslim-majority countries just weeks after Donald Trump took office, and expanding to other countries since, with fewer student visas being offered by the State Department. The impact on many of our students and their feeling of vulnerability has been acute. The anxiety was recently exacerbated when the FBI, under the auspices of helping the government thwart the illegal transfer of intellectual property to foreign rivals, primarily China, China asked college and university administrators, including Columbia, to develop new protocols for monitoring foreign-born students and visiting scholars, particularly if they are ethnic Chinese. In an op-ed in the Washington Post, I publicly challenged these efforts by the federal government as ill-advised and contrary to the spirit of open inquiry that has been the keystone of the great success of our universities. The second and more insidious assault on the university in America is the persistent undermining of respect for truth and the facts, and the creation of a culture of hatred and prejudice that now infects the private sphere in the country. This systematic coordinated campaign to erode public trust in our institutions comes at immeasurable cost, especially for journalism and the press, which are always, from my perspective, the first layer of society that feels the brunt of intolerance just before universities do. As journalism goes, so in the end goes the scholar, in my experience. I would like to close, however, on a note of optimism, which I am able to do because of the history of my field, freedom of speech and press, and my home of Columbia University. I do not believe this is a time for despair. Precisely 100 years ago in the United States, and here in Europe, our societies were subject to extraordinary stresses that also put at risk truth and reason, civility and decency, human rights and compassion. Those who believed in enlightenment values stepped in to repair the breaches. That's when the United States Supreme Court began its now century-long journey to establish protections of freedom of thought and expression never before seen in the history of the world. And that's when Columbia University on a very local scale joined with other institutions and individuals in celebrating the best of human nature by doubling down on academic virtues and creating a new year-long required course called Contemporary Civilization, which became the famous core curriculum, with the objective of applying the learning derived from classic texts to the problems facing society in the aftermath of a cataclysmic, cataclysmic war. These two great achievements in advancing the search for truth were born in dark and troublesome days, and we can do the same. The work you are doing here to think deeply and seriously about overcoming the formidable problems we face and to build a stronger future is part of that continuum. Thank you for inviting me to join you in this endeavor.
Thank you very much, um, Lee Bollinger, for providing this um, very interesting speech and also, as Anthony has introduced already, as a friend of the ESPAS process for so generously hosting us um, in New York. You made a number of points which I think were interesting. First, you described as the core function of research universities that this is the precondition for innovation. And um, this is interesting for us because uh, we have started our own reflections on the future of our parliament, focusing on innovation through so-called innovation days this year. So we feel very much comforted by um, what, uh, the, let's say, what you have explained as, as your own core. There's something, of course, which for us is a little bit more challenging because you've also said all of this comes out of a system which basically doesn't want to execute control. <laughs> so people are chosen very early on and then basically they do as they like. Uh, there is still a bigger, longer path to go for European pu public administrations to embrace that principle, even though I share it to a large extent. You also highlighted how American universities have successfully globalized. Mm -hmm. So in fact, globalization is not just in the economy, it's in universities. And we can even observe for the European Parliament that you know we have 12 people working in Washington, D.C. We have since the 1st of October somebody in Jakarta. The Bureau has decided to send somebody to the African Union. We want to build up continental democracies, uh, contacts much more closely with India, with Brazil, with Indonesia. So to a certain extent, globalization is a challenge we all have to face in our specific field. And you have demonstrated quite strikingly that American universities have quite successfully done this. You also said that it's very important that now research and practical capacities somehow combine, but by at the same time guaranteeing aloofness uh, for researchers. And at the end you have issues and numbers of concerns, uh, especially linked to what generally is called populism, which regards us as well. So we have seen that in fact university is part of a much wider ecosystem. Uh, where we are also part of, which is guaranteeing the basis of democracy. So, I would like now to open up the floor for all of you, please. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Ayaka Suzuki. I am currently Director of Strategic Planning in the Secretary General's Office at the United Nations. I also went to Barnard and School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia, so uh, full disclosure. Um, I, I note that the title of this lecture was called The Future of University and Not Future of Learning. As you are no doubt aware, there's a lot of discussions about how with the digital transformation and change of the, uh, the well, future of work, future of education also needs to change dramatically. And while it's very clear that uh, research in university will probably retain its spot, um, the broader ecosystem of learning and the modalities of learning would have to change quite a bit. I mean, it's said that uh, there's 12 years of mandatory education plus four years of college and graduate studies and that's it, you're, you're done studying, will no longer apply because people constantly need to change their skills and adapt almost every couple of years, right? So, uh, and then it doesn't seem that, um, that no, no country in the world, maybe except for Finland, is, is really trying to adapt the basic educational system. So I just wanted to, uh, to uh, get your views on what you think about that, this transformation that nobody seems to be prepared for. And by the way, the Columbia World Project is really great. Uh, we worked with Avril already, and it's, I think that's a great yeah, initiative. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, this is something that I think uh, uh, really needs to have a lot of attention. It's great that you've raised it. Um, so many things to say about it. I mean, the, the basic question I'll try to answer is uh, universities and the higher education system adjusting to a reality that people need to learn over the course of a lifetime, not just when they're um, 18 uh, to 27 or something. Um, so again, referring to Columbia, there is a model program uh, that's somewhat, that is unique in America, 
uh, but I think is the, is the basis for the future. And that program is called General Studies. General Studies is um, created, was created after the Second World War for soldiers returning, uh, who of course were older than the 18 year olds who were coming into college as freshmen. And it has grown into, um, of course, much larger uh, institution that takes people from every age, all walks of life, uh, typically called non-traditional students. It's now, um, you know, thousands of, of, um, of people who come through this. Um, and what it proves is that talent emerges at different times in people's lives, not only at the age of 17. And there are people who are not doing so well in life at 17 or want to do different things, be a ballet dancer, or, uh, do something else, travel, etc., start a business, but at age 35, they want to come back and, and complete a college degree. And this program is set up for them, and they take regular classes, all the same classes, they're mixed in with the undergraduates, I teach a class every fall on First Amendment, freedom of speech and press. I'll have students from, you know, un undergraduate, classic students, and I'll have students from general studies. And the amazing thing is, is that they do just as well, if not, you know, as the extraordinary students who come in at that age. We are also expanding rapidly. Um, the number of online programs, hybrid programs, where students uh, take uh, master's degrees online and then spend some time on the campus. We now have several thousand students a year in this. Uh, I think it's a, it, much experimentation is going on about how universities like Columbia cannot just be the, the place for a very small number of very, very talented and gifted students uh, at, at certain ages, but really a much broader public uh, education. I think this will uh, change dramatically. It is also, frankly, a source of revenue for universities, and that's a powerful uh, incentive. But I think first and foremost, it's a sense of responsibility to spread educational benefits more broadly. Um, hi, I'm Marika Olberg. I'm with the Mercator Institute for China Studies um, in Berlin. Um, I'm also a Columbia University alumni, so great to have you here. Um, I want to challenge you on two things that you said, or I, I guess raise some questions about them. The first one is you mentioned that you were approached by, I don't know if it was the FBI or wherever, to develop protocols on how to deal with Chinese espionage on campus. And I fully agree with you that a lot of the suggestions that are going to be made by authorities are going to be wrong, but I do want to ask how you would deal with harassment of both scholars and students on campus from Chinese authorities. And being a person who's been on the, on the receiving end of that, I know that it's real and it's incredibly hard to deal with. So, so what are proper protocols um, to address that? And the other issue that you raised is global campuses. Um, and, and I agree it's great. I also know that in the Chinese case, at least, if you have, there's no such thing as a satellite campus in theory. It is a, a university subsidiary that is subject to Chinese laws. Now, if a large university does that, they may often get some benefits and maybe get some exceptions, but smaller universities often are subject fully to Chinese laws. So what does that do to academic freedom, um, both in the world, but especially on those campuses abroad? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Hans Christian Hagman from the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Professor, thank you very much for preaching to the choir. I mean, half of us are probably products of your system anyway. Uh, and you represent perhaps the finest and most important element of American soft power. Could I ask you, Professor, to give some tough love to Europe? Um, what does Europe need to learn from the U.S. education system? Where have we gone soft or stale or uh, a bit old? Uh, what do we need to do in order to be, remain vital in the next generation or two in Europe? Thank you. My name is Charlie Warwick. I'm from Kantar, but I'm here with a global cohort of next generation foresight practitioners. Thank you for that. That was amazing. Perhaps linked to this question of vitality. Um, I've been getting into American football recently. And um, I was just wondering, because college athletics generally seem like the most visible face of higher education in the States for a lot of people. Um, and yesterday we had a really compelling diagnosis of 
populism. Uh, I can't remember who it was said it, populism is fostered by, or fosters intimacy and community building as opposed to competency. But I'd argue that college athletics are a great celebration of intimacy and competency. So given that you know, you're, you're part ultimately of the same institutional ecosystem, the sport and the academics and research, what can the academic and research functions of the uni learn from the sports side of things? And then maybe what can we learn from that in Europe to, to Hans's question? Thank you. It, what we can learn in academics from college athletics? I think so, just as in terms Usually of Usually I vitality. get exactly the opposite <laughs> question. I mean, it's how you know, come college vitality, athletics controls... Community building, intimacy, that, that kind of thing that seems to be kind of spreading like wildfire. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lauren Withacombe Keeler. I'm a professor at Arizona State University. Um, and I just wanted to be a bit provocative for a moment with my question and say, um, as particularly given the education level in this audience, that uh, and when we think about the, the eco side that the gentleman before was referencing, um, and uh, the number of planetary boundaries that we've crossed, the energy systems, the transportation systems that have contributed to that and that we still maintain are designed and created by people with college degrees. So are universities not partially responsible for educating the people that have created the systems that have brought us to the brink of collapse? And if so, how do we educate differently so that we can educate for transformation and change? Well, um, I mean, just to be clear, what the federal government and the FBI in particular were doing was asking universities like Columbia to engage in surveillance on graduate students and uh, Chinese students, foreign-born students who were uh, working in laboratories and, and so on at Columbia and, and elsewhere. And that's what I said we should not do, uh, engage in general surveillance. Uh, in terms of uh, the Chinese government harassing Chinese students who are studying at Columbia. Of course, we're always, we, we don't have many instances of that but, uh, that we've encountered, but we're always there to, uh, to try to help students, try to make sure that they know we are there. That relates to a question, uh, to, to help, that relates to a question uh, the, about branch campuses. And there are many things, of course, I could have said uh, further about every subject that I touched upon. But branch campuses as one way to deal with an interdependent globalized world to make sure that the American universities are out there in the world capturing uh, knowledge and students and so on. It is true that one problem and the reason I didn't go this route and went for this much smaller kind of global center that doesn't have faculty and students just there to help, there is this problem of uh, you are vulnerable to academic freedom violations. Uh, so if you have a campus in X country, you've invested a lot of money and you have students and faculty there, and if the government says you can no longer teach this or we don't want to have this kind of speech on campus, it's very hard for you to get up and leave. <laughs> and, and our system is designed that we can close it in, in a week. Uh, we can be out of a country if we have violations of academic freedom that we regard as uh, violating our core values. So this is a problem um, uh, that, that we face, no question about it. Um, what can Europe do? You know, I, I think there is a magic in this, um, in this crazy formula. Uh, the, the formula is, as I said, in essence, you get young people who are incredibly talented um, in their studies and students and seem to have a taste for discovering new knowledge, give them a trial, uh, and, and then give them uh, the opportunity to build a lifetime around this. Um, that magic, uh, I realize, has to have a certain culture of, about it, has to have respect from the society, uh, has to have a decent uh, salary and prospects of a future. Uh, you have to protect people, truly protect them in this. You have to believe in it. Um, uh, so I, I think it's the, the right way to, to go. Um, and you, you have to be tolerant of something that doesn't match with the rest of society. I mean, if you think of businesses, I mean, you, you, nobody gets tenure. Everybody has to kind of prove themselves every year. Uh, so it's, it's inconsistent with the way in which we organize much, most all of society, but it works, so um, it's empirically uh, validated. Um, 
Uh, the college sports, I, I, I don't know quite how to, I'm, I'm shocked by this um, because, you know, it is a problem that university presidents talk about all the time. How are college sports athletics driving uh, uh, university uh, activities? I mean, the University of Michigan uh, has a fairly famous football program, um, as m many of you know. It has 110,000 people every single home game. Uh, that there, and those, uh, indiv <laughs> that's not the intimate uh, kind of experience that I think of. It is college spirit, it is a spirit, uh, but it's a hard thing to make the case that, um, that scholarship should learn from what, uh, what we're doing in that setting. Ivy League tries to build a different kind of scholar athlete, a very low profile um, uh, sort of program, and I, I think there it's a, the idea is recognizing that young people uh, learn through lots of ways, including athletics. My name is John Wiles. Um, I, just a very, very brief anecdote about Chinese students and harassment. Um, th uh, three or four years ago, I gave a talk at Durham Business School, um, at the end of which one Chinese student got up and delivered a diatribe against Europe. Our economy was no good. The uh, political system was a failure, etc., etc. And he went on at some length. Discussion moved on. Uh, when, I, when, he, when I finished and went outside, this poor fellow was up against the wall being beaten up by his colleagues, Chinese colleagues, because he'd obviously uh, in, in broken a protocol, as it were, violated a protocol, um, and um, he certainly wouldn't do that again on the evidence of uh, the blows he was receiving. My question, though, is really about the boundaries between universities and business. Um, really, I would just be interested in your reflection on whether the boundaries are clear enough, um, strong enough to make, leave us all fully reassured about the future of academic freedom. Thank you for uh, taking my question. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at your presentation, sir. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask about this populism and the trends that we hear about. My question is simply why are masses responding to it? in most places, in other words, we just learned yesterday about elections in Germany. We hear about other elections. My question is, why are people responding positively to populism? And I would also wanna say that in certain intellectual circles, uh, it, it almost sounds like an endorsement if you even raise the question. So it becomes a little bit dismissive on, on the intellectual side. So I wanted to just get your thoughts. And by the way, I went to Cornell, which I would argue is physically the closest you can get to Colombia. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation of the problems, but also the, the, the nice aspects of the American University. <laughs> and of course, we know that this is a, uh, my name is Maurizio Cotta from the University of Siena in Italy. Uh, we know that the American model of research university is very strong model, a beautiful model. At the same time, in large parts of the world, this model, which is a very costly, expensive model, cannot be easily transferred. So could you elaborate, since we have a, a global problem of advancing, improving university education, uh, could you r elaborate a bit on what aspects of American universities can be exported in this less, in a less costly, less rich environment and in order to make good university even where resources are most scarce, as in large parts of, let's say, third world, Africa, whatever. Okay, thank you. Denise Kirkop from the European Parliamentary Research Service. Um, I follow education and youth in the re research service. And I find it very interesting that when I am in touch with universities, uh, they, they kind of express, so people from universities in the EU, they kind of express a resentment towards the EU as pushing a neoliberal agenda. And I take this to mean that uh, we are pushing a model that is a bit away from the um, uh, humanistic model that is uh, may be quite prevalent, and 
that uh, this is a bit impinging on, let's say, uh, some freedom of uh, practice and critical thinking and uh, other sort of commitments which you yourself have referred to in your speech. Um, I was wondering whether this is a concern in the US um, and if you have any comments on it, thank you. Leo Sultanartold, uh, indeed involved in ESPAS itself. I work for the uh, Secretary of the Council of the European Union. Um, I just want to reiterate the question that was uh, uh, slightly earlier by a lady down there about the um, uh, fact that uh, science has uh, indeed brought uh, lots of marvelous inventions, but now, as she said, at the brink of collapse, um, uh, whether it would not be necessary to uh, have a if I remember well what she said, a new kind of scientist who uh, tackles the responsibilities uh, in view of the planetary boundaries that we are uh, now facing. The name is Simon Serfati. Um, as one who's been teaching uh, for the past 40, 45 years plus, in major universities, Johns Hopkins, UCLA, I'm a bit astonished and quite candidly concerned over the fact that you almost dismissed the issues of cost and debt, which condition increasingly the decisions which uh, U.S. universities are making with regard to their activities around the world, for example, as a procedure in global fundraising, <laughs> really more than as an investment in the uh, patterns of education in the world and the inability of students increasingly to commit their time to study, since they have to devote half of their time at least to raising money, which did not, which will not enable them to pay for the tuition, but will enable them to reduce their debt level. <laughs> from escalating further. And to that extent, I wonder whether we could not reverse an earlier question and ask what is it that European institutions should avoid doing <laughs> relative to American institutions which have set up an example of what is to be done, but certainly not a model to the extent that they themselves I've committed excesses. On the last one, I did not mean to take lightly the issue of student debt. I did intend to say a couple things about it. Uh, one is that uh, financial aid in a certain number, of, a small number of private institutions is uh, quite extraordinary and important to recognize. The need-blind admission system of a Columbia uh, is very real. The real problem, I'm trying to say, is in public funding of state universities, public universities, and that is a serious, serious problem. It needs more national state investment in education than has been true over the past 30, 40 years. And again, when I was at the University of Michigan, dean of the law school, president of the university, the, the decline of state funding was marked. And if you want to have leading work on, in science and engineering and humanities and so on, you need a public investment to, to make it work. Um, I'm personally not in favor of uh, free tuition for everyone because I think that is a subsidy for wealth. Um, but that, of course, is on the table now in the uh, presidential campaign, as everybody here knows. And I know it's been part of the ethos of a lot of European uh, institutions. Uh, I really do believe that public investment in, in universities is a critical requirement, including on the cost. Um, I think that the... Um, the, the the question of um, openness, uh, this environment of free inquiry, of open inquiry, of um, curiosity and all, is, is really, really at the core of what drives uh, these institutions. That is in tension with this other 
part that I'm also trying to emphasize, which is involvement of universities and research in practical problems of the world. So those two things, the question is, can they exist together and can they be beneficial uh, in relationship? I believe we can do much more of the be involved in the world affairs and take without undermining in any way, indeed enhancing, the underlying curiosity-driven research. That's the mission and that's the tension, that's the puzzle. The example here, as I said, is biomedical research, medical research, which is extremely strong across American uh, leading research universities. And we do patient care. I mean, people actually practice medicine at the same time that they are doing this, and the sense of uh, mutual reinforcement is very strong. We did not go that route in creating law schools, which I know really well. We could have had the equivalent of a hospital. We could have had a large law firm. We could have a thousand person law firm at Columbia generating a lot of revenues to support the underlying basic research, research of people like me writing books and articles about constitutional law. But we didn't go that route. The question is, we do a lot of tech transfer. question was raised about business, the relationship of universities to business. Beginning in the early 1980s, the federal government said, we want basic research to be commercialized and to create products, drugs, et cetera, that will benefit people. As an incentive to do that, universities will be able to create patents and intellectual property and keep in these inventions and keep the profits. This is a major source of revenue to American universities. Has it distorted the underlying academic work and driven it more towards profit making kinds of things because the researcher gets a cut in the profits? I don't think so. I think in, on the whole, it's been a great success. My view is we can do the hospital tech transfer Lots of people who are already involved in practical affairs make it more organized and, and um, comprehensive and create a role for universities that is much more positive in the world. The question is, can we do that? That's the mission we're, we're trying to do. Um, why are populist messages uh, appealing now? So as a person who is a student of the First Amendment, uh, my general feeling is this is part of, of, of life. If you look back over the 100 years that it has taken to develop the principles, freedom of speech and press in the United States, as I like to say, and I've just written a book with Jeff Stone of Chicago on this, it was in 1919 that the Supreme Court of the United States decided the first case interpreting the First Amendment. There's no Supreme Court case before then. So all that we're talking about in free speech, free press in the United States is 100 years old. And in fact, it didn't really get going in the way it is today until 1960. So it's like 50 years of free speech jurisprudence. In that period of 100 years, the intolerance, the populism, the censorship has spiked at times, right after and during World War I, right after World War II, and coming into the McCarthy period, much worse in those periods than today. And uh, we're still in it, so we don't know what the outcome will be, but, but I think it's been much worse. In other words, I find myself saying, to my, I shouldn't be shocked that what we're seeing today is sort of unheard of or unthought about. The mistake is thinking, this mistake is being shocked because that suggests an underlying naivete. That means that when times are good and you don't have this, you're not attending to it because you think it's probably over and done. This is something that I think every society is vulnerable to the natural impulses, this is part of the free speech um, uh, greatness I love, a premise 
of freedom of speech in the United States among people like Oliver Wendell Holmes and the great cases is that people are naturally intolerant. Not just naturally, you know, go for reason and openness and so on. It is instinctive in human nature to be intolerant. Holmes's great line, which was in November of 1919, persecution for the expression of opinion seems to me to be perfectly logical. That's what we, I think, have to recognize. Build institutions around. We obviously haven't done that as successfully as we might. My hope is that the last 50 years of free speech, free press jurisprudence will stand and be a barrier to any attempts by the government to try to do what was done in the 1950s or the 1920s. And uh, so it's a complicated, uh, complicated subject. That doesn't provide the full answer, but it is a perspective uh, that I find is important and interesting. Professor Bollinger, thank you very, very much indeed for what I think by common consent, uh, it was a really stimulating, very, very arresting set of remarks, which we really appreciate. Thank you, Secretary General Vella, for um, opening the discussion. Let us join together to thank Professor Bollinger for being here today. Thank you very much. <laughs>